Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. learners to the session of international business management. I am Dr. Manisha Goswami, assistant professor at Institute of Business Management, GLA University, Mathura. Let's start with lecture number two on strategies of international business. Before starting with the lecture, let's look at what we did in the lecture number one. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the evolution of international business we even come to know about the various nature, scope and importance of international business as far as the national economy is concerned. We also studied the reason of studying international business and even we able to identify the drivers of international business so far. So now let's look at the different topics that we will be covering in lecture number two. In this lecture, we will talk about the difference between international business and domestic business. Second, we will also be talking about the various strategies of entering into international business. So let's start with lecture number two and have a discussion on differences between international business and domestic business. The first basis of difference between international and domestic business is the geographical boundaries. As far as the geographical boundaries are concerned, in international business, there is no such demarcation of the geography. You can do business wherever you want to, depending upon the kind of country you want to enter, the kind of economy you want to enter, the kind of resources you are having and the kind of resources you might be seeking from the host country, you can get into any country. For example, Fujitsu is a Japanese company manufacturing hard disk, RAM, they are into the manufacturing of motherboard, they all are producing such product though it's a Japanese company, but they are manufacturing these products in China, Vietnam, Korea, Malaysia, right? And uh, that, that's what possible because of the international business, right? There is no boundary, so they can easily move from their home country, Japan, to various other Host countries like China, they move to, they like they move to Vietnam, Korea, right? They are trying to figure out that where I can get the resources at a cheaper rate, where I can have good quality of the infrastructure, the technology or the manpower at reasonably low cost. So I can easily move to. So as far as international business is concerned, it is one of the plus point or the advantage that you can easily move out from your home country to the host country and can see seek possible resources over there, you can seek new market, you can seek new liberal government policies. Another example is like LG Korean, uh, LG is a Korean company, they are having the business ranging from smartphone to washing machine and the fridge. They are not only producing the things in the Korea, they are also producing things in Vietnam, China and India. So that's an another example of geographical expansion of international business. As far as the domestic business are concerned and uh, these are those kind of the business which confine their uh, business within the territory of the country. Domestic companies are those having business within their territories. That means they are not crossing their home country. They are doing business within the confined area. As per the World Bank of Development Indicator, India was reported to have around 5,215 domestic companies as per the data given by them in the year 2020. So we can now say the geographical boundaries are plenty when it comes to domestic business and as far as international business is concerned, there is no geographical boundary. You can easily move from one place to another. Next is the business regulation. When you are doing international business, there is going to be the tough business regulations. And when you are into, rather than tough, there will be multiple business regulations. When you are doing international business, there will be multiple business regulation. However, in case of domestic business, there will be 
only limited business regulation because you are dealing with your own country your home country and the existing government whatever the rules and policy they have as far as the taxation the labor laws employment regulation antitrust regulatory laws are concerned whatever they are having for their home country you just have to adhere to them when it comes to international business it's not just about their home country government rules and regulation they equally have to take into consideration the host country government rules and regulation because they are they might be having some joint venture with the host country they might be into some exporting they might be into some merger they might be into some acquisition they might have some wholly owned subsidiary in the various host country so wherever you have your plants your subsidiaries your venture you need to take into account the government that country government taxation policy that country government employment policies that country government their policies as far as the the, uh, the resource acquisition is concerned as far as antitrust regulatory is concerned you have to take into consideration of all of them so in short what we can say business regulations are going to be difficult and plenty when it comes to international business to understand where in case of domestic business it is just about one single country third basis of difference between political and domestic business is the political risk when you are dealing in a single country the political risk is going to be comparatively high say in the case of domestic business political risk would be high because if your current country under is undergoing certain economic crisis or the recession is going on or the political instability is there then what is going to happen your entire business will be thrashed or collapse on the contrary side if you are having a business not only in your own country but you are also having a business in multiple host countries then there is a possibility to overcome such kind of the political risk let's take an example of a greece in the greece economy what happened the various european countries and private investor have loaned greece nearly 320 billion euro it was the biggest financial rescue of the bankrupt country in the history if anybody would have invested in the greece market and that's the only sole investment or to think about the greece domestic companies how they how adverse how much adverse time the people might be undergoing since 2010 till now still the adversities are on still they are, are fighting they still able to pay just 41.6 billion euro to these investors and hoping to pay the rest of the amount by 2060s so the things are very adverse when it comes to when you are solely relying on single market as far as international business is concerned you will be having plenty markets in your in your uh, loop and if in case any market is not doing well the other market probably might be doing well so you can have a backup of the money from those markets and you easily you can be out from that uh, bankrupt country let's talk about the next difference that is difference in the business practice when it comes to international business the difference in business practice are going to be very significant and prominent and you have to take into account before taking a decision of opening any uh, company in the host country because if you try to follow your own country style of business your your own country uh, style of doing business practices then it might not be successful because many of the time it has been observed the business practices are regulated largely by the business regulations of that country so you need to adjust and change your business practice depending upon the business regulation prevailing in the country so in in, in case of international business understanding of business practice depending upon the business regulation is utmost important where in case of domestic business as you are dealing with single government you are within your home country then the business practice are going to be more or less common or more or less going to be constant or the same for the entire country right a business practice are actually the these are the different attempts which business put in you know, most of the uh, in in the organization in order to get their work done in a most effective way or in the most uh, or you can say in the least cost 
manner right it also talk about how you are able to engage your worker how you able to get your work done how you are actually making the people to uh, generate maximum profits with the minimum resources and right? how you are channelizing the commitment level of your employee how you are giving rewards to your employee everything is included in that various business practice so you as a company have to figure out what kind of the reward system is going to be possible in a particular host country depending upon the business regulation you are going to set them right and these reward policies and the engaging of worker is also going to vary from country to country so when you are dealing with indian in, uh, workers their mindset their ideology in order to engage in the work is going to be from the home country in which they are from so you you being an international business have to find out the mindset of the worker or the citizens of the host country what their exact mindset is and how, how you can set the correct engagement strategies in that country how you can set the correct reward strategies in that organization how you can develop the commitment level of that worker you have to figure this out depending upon and this business practice is largely going to be governed by the business regulation so it's a point of concern when it is a international business it is not a much point of concern when it comes to a domestic business now let's move to the next point that is the currency system currency system is talking about how that what kind of current which different currency you need to use in order to have your trading right so uh, the, the largely there are certain universally acceptable currency like us dollar american and dollar is considered to be one of the most preferred currency to do transaction but by and large what different countries do they use to peg their home country currency with the renowned and recognized universally acceptable currency like american dollar and then on the basis of that they are going to fix the exchange rate of the currency and many of the time what the central bank of that country they used to do they used to buy or sell the foreign country currency with which they have pegged their currency in order to control the valuation of the home country currency currency system usually it requires when you are dealing with the country like india you have to either carry us dollar or you have to convert your home country into a currency currency and you have to bear certain convertibility charges say for in case any indian investor is investing in the foreign market what they would be doing they they have to either carry us dollar with them pound euro yen these are four predominantly acceptable foreign universal currencies if you are carrying out of any of the any of them out, uh, then you can easily do the transaction you don't have to bear the convertibility charges otherwise you have to bear the convertibility charges of uh, converting your currency into the host country currency now let's talk about the next point that is the mobility of factors of production Uh, before starting with this let me uh, conclude the currency system the con currency system is going to be a major point of concern when it is a international business as far as when it is a domestic business it is not a much concern because within the country you will be dealing with your own country currency and when it comes to an international business then in that case you have to convert the currency right so i think this topic is clear now we are moving towards the next basis of difference between international and domestic business that is the mobility of factors of production in when it comes to international business mobility of factors of production is going to be very difficult because the factors of production like land labor capital cannot be so easily moved on you have to bear the charges for moving the factors of production from one country to another where in case of domestic business it is comparatively easier to transfer the resources from one place to another next basis of difference is the nature of customer when it comes to a uh, international business the nature of customer is going to be for sure heterogeneous 
heterogeneous customers are those who are very uh, who are having different mindset right you cannot have a single strategy for uh, for a customer uh, and in order to sell your products to them you need to find out the multiple strategy if you want to cover the entire population you need to have a multiple strategy to captivate such diversified and heterogeneous customer segment so when it comes to an international business you are having heterogeneous customer your home country customer taste and preference might be very different from the host country customer taste and preferences so you need to figure out that how you will be striking the balance between the two different set of the customer so it is a challenging case in case of international business but when it comes to domestic business it is comparatively less heterogeneous when it comes to india india do have a lot of diversity in the population but it is comparatively less heterogeneous as compared to the international business more or less when we think about the countries having purely the christian christianity or the islamic countries there we can say that there are homogeneous customer but when it comes to country like india where there are a lot of diversity already there in the population so we can say the heterogeneity of the customer is comparatively at lower side the next basis of difference is business research now the business research is is going to be very easy when you are in the domestic company when you are having a domestic business you can easily do the research you have a limited uh, area limited population to do the research of when it comes to international business as the hetero they are heterogeneous customer the concluding the business research is going to be little hectic and cumbersome and uh, so that is why as far as business research for the international business perspective is concerned is going to be the toughest job where in case of domestic business is comparatively easier job next basis of difference is the capital investment when it comes to international business you need to invest heavily however in case of domestic business the capital investment can be moderate or it can be kept at low as compared to international business so in this particular slide we talked about the difference between international and domestic business now let's move forward to the strategies for going international there are certain i there are certain questions that you have to put towards yourself and try to find out the best answer of those questions that would be the right way of approaching to international market first question that arises when you are selecting the correct strategy for international business is deciding whether to go global this question brings in mind two factors that deciding whether to go global uh, why i actually need to go global they can be the push factor or they can be a pull factor push factors are negative factor say for example if i am finding so suffocating being at my own country because of tough competition because of tough regulatory system of the government or i might not be getting the required resources and the, or if else if i am getting the resources they are very costly for me so what i would be doing i would start searching for other countries across the globe where i can find better solution to the problem which i am undergoing take an example of finland based nokia company finland was not if the nokia company uh, when they try to enter to india market they were were struggling very hard in the finland home country and what they realized that they couldn't do anything in their own country so they moved to the country like india and they did pretty well till 2007 before the launch of android by google they did pretty well they had a 85% of market share with us in india so that was a push factor why nokia moved from finland their home based country to country like us take an example of flipkart in order to get themselves registered as indian e-commerce regulatory body was very tough so they thought of instead of registering their company here in india they moved to singapore because the e-commerce regulatory system of singapore is comparatively liberal as compared to india 
so these are the reason why which may compel you to move out from your home country and look for some other host country to start doing your business as it is mentioned in the slides also tough competition in the home country can be the reason for searching for global market tough government regulation is also another reason for searching global market low demand of the product produced in the home country is also the reason for moving for international market that that happened in case of nokia and they were having low demand of their product in the finland so they start looking for other market where the product can be established can be positioned in the mind of the customer more better as compared to their own home country economical downturn in the home country take example of greece example of venezuela even in case of 2008 there were a lot of recession in america even india also get affected because of that so that leads to you no know, making a company to move from your home country to the various different host country another reason aside the push factor can be a pull factor you might be doing incredibly well in your own country but you want to expand your business because your hunger for earning the profit is still not over so you want to further multiply your profit margins you want to further grow in the market so what you would be doing you would be moving from your home country to various other host country and you start looking for possible measures of doing business in the host country right because you it's not like that you are struggling hard in your home country you are well settled in your home country you are earning hefty amount in your home country but still you want to expand your business because you want to further multiply your profit so you start looking for possible countries where the competition is still not is still not very massive it's still not in the red ocean category or where the government policies are very liberal or where uh, the resources are comparatively cheaper so you would like to move to such country even the political stability will also be one of the factor for attracting the attention of foreign companies toward various companies and uh, as in case of the apple company when they moved to india before that there was a huge demand of apple product in india which actually pulled the apple company to move to india to have their own manufacturing setup over here so these are the reasons these could be the reason for moving into global market so far so we have understood deciding whether to go global largely depend upon two factors that is one is push factor another is the pull factor push factor are negative in nature whereas pull factors are positive right you, positive factors means that when you are doing good in your own country you always try to look for best possible solution in the foreign country also and negative factors when you are struggling hard only in your own country and you still want to do business then you start looking for other possible options in the host country to do your business now let's talk about the deciding when to go to global what can be the that uh, what is going to be the exact time or is there any hard and fast rule for deciding when to go global so far you have understood that whether we need to go global or not yes or no answer can you can answer yourself on the basis of these two broad categories that is a push and pull factor now the next question arises deciding the time of entering into the global market so for this let us understand uh the let's try to understand the analogy on the basis of uh, the pl uh, the product life cycle right so let's try to understand how you will be uh, able to figure out that whether it's a right time to go for the global market or not so uh, this is your pls right plc that is product life cycle here it's your introductory stage this is your growth stage and then there is your uh, you have significantly moved on to the uh, saturation or maturity stage and then finally to the decline stage let me draw it correctly yes let's look at this pls this is your introductory stage this is your growth stage and this is your saturation and decline this is the introductory stage introduction took place this is your growth stage this is your maturity 
and the decline state. That means your, when you have launched your product in the market, it's a stage of the introduction. You have just launched the product, right? Time span is less, sale is also very less. Eventually, you're able to establish your product in the market, you move to the growth stage. Now, you have certain recognition in the market. People started realizing the, that such kind of product exists in the market. They start relating your product with their need or uh, you able to position your product in the market well. That is the beginning of the growth stage of the market, growth stage of your product. Finally, there is going to be the maturity or saturation stage of the product because may might be because of some new product might be launched in the market so people their taste and preference might be slightly going to shift from your product to other but still there is a maturity and this is the peak of your growth right this is the peak of your profits and roi and here you are getting maximum returns on your investments and eventually the product is going to get declined it's going to be of no use for the market the people might start looking for some other better alternatives so now the question arises that when to enter into the market, whether this stage is the right stage to enter into the market or this stage is the right stage to enter into the market or maturity stage or the decline stage. Answer is right as you are a budding company, you might be having a very uh, small capital reservoir. So introductory stage would never be a right stage to enter because you are already putting lot of money to establish your product in your own country. So this is not going to be the right time to enter into. As far as the growth stage is concerned, still you are investing heavily in this particular product to be positioned well in your own country. So, Though market is established, people start recognizing, you start getting returns, but still this is not going to be the right time to enter into the market. Ideally, maturity or the saturation stage is going to be considered as a time for further investment because this is the stage where you are getting maximum profits. You are getting maximum inputs from the customer. Whatever you have invested, now this is the time not to put a single penny on this product. There is no need of investment and this product is going to leverage profits to you. So how to utilize this profit? By finding out various different other countries where you can invest and find new potential and to start again with the introductory stage in that host country. So I think you able to understand that before the decline comes, before the product become liability to you, the right time for entering into international market would be when you are at your maturity stage because this is the time when you are earning hefty amount and this amount can be channelized in investing by investing in various foreign subsidiaries or foreign units or you can have your branch office or you can have your joint venture or merger, whatever the mode of entry you want to, you can easily get into it because you are getting money you don't have to borrow much though you have to but still you don't have to borrow much as you are already earning good amount from your existing product before it declines it is always advisable to look for new market new prospects before the product becomes a liability to you so i think with this uh, diagram you will be able to understand the right time for entering into the market so product life cycle could be a right uh, right uh, uh, way of understanding what is going to be your right time for entering into international market. Now let's look into the different entry modes. The this fourth, this third one, deciding the mode of entry. Now let's talk about the various mode of entering into the international market. You can enter into international market either through FDI. You or you can enter through FII. FDI is going to be a investment in the host country by buying certain plant or manufacturing setup or signing some agreements. Where in case of portfolio investment via FII, foreign institutional investors, you being at your home country, making a decision of buying some of the shares of the stock market like Nasdaq, Tokyo, right, London Stock Exchange, you might be taking a decision of buying the company's share uh, through FII. That money is considered to be a volatile money. 
where in case of the foreign direct investment it is considered to be a significant fixed earning of a particular country so foreign direct investment can be of three different types one it could be greenfield investment now what greenfield investment is greenfield investment is that you are starting your business from scratch in the host country you you are starting your business from buying buying the plant you might be buying a plant you are setting setting up the manufacturing units right what you are doing you are setting up your manufacturing units there in the host country so you are buying a plant and everything is taking place in the host country right so greenfield investment when you start your business from zero level you buy the plant you set up your manufacturing unit you go for recruitment and selection you go for fixing the business policies right you go for all licensing and everything all alone that is a greenfield investment another type of the greenfield investment could be a greenfield development this is one of the types here also you are starting a business from the scratch but here in the in case of the greenfield development what you are doing you are buying your land under specific list which was listed by the government now what is that list and why government has a specified list of the places where you can invest because government want the infrastructural development government want the balanced growth of the entire country they don't want the loop sided growth or imbalanced growth of a country so as government want the balanced growth of the entire country they equally want to cover the rural area of a country or the area which are less developed so what they do they have classified certain list of special economic zone area they have classified certain list of the economic zone area right and these special economic zone areas are going to be the facilitating point for the go for the government as well as for the new investors to understand that how they will be investing in the foreign country greenfield development is again about starting a business from zero but in rural area or the area where the infrastructural development is required heavily and the list is already provided by the government you being the foreign investor if invest in such kind of uh, area or the places you will be getting certain benefits or rebate from the government as far as india is concerned the total number of special economic zone area listed by the government so far are 378 in number out of which 265 are operational one of the best example of a special economic zone area is dmr aerospace and the industrial park has notified 250 acres of the park as multi multi product a special economic zone area out of which 20 acre is going to be used as a free trade zone so uh, if anybody would like to invest in these kind of the projects they will be easily be getting the benefits of the government and it is going to be a win win situation for both government and the foreign investor government will able to develop the infrastructure of a country will able to improve the resources availability and at the same time the foreign investor will also be benefited because they are getting rebates and relaxation now the third type of foreign direct investment is brownfield investment which is actually not starting from zero it is starting from some level like in case of greenfield investment and greenfield development we have seen the people are starting from zero level here it is not the case here what they would be doing they will be starting from some level like through mergers through joint ventures jvs rather right you might be starting a business with certain strategic alliances you might be doing business through takeovers right or acquisitions so when you are having a foreign investment that is through merger joint venture strategic alliances or acquisitions it is going to be come under the brownfield investment now let's talk about the different entry modes which is related to trade trade related entry mode that means you are just doing trading with the host country first is the exporting here the exporting could be direct it could be indirect as well 
and it could be through contractual mode it could be a contractual mode when you are doing direct exporting see i am manufacturing certain stuff over here in india and i know the client in foreign market i would be directly selling my product to that person and in direct mode i am a manufacturer i am a farmer i am producing certain stuff here i might be producing wheat rice right but there is there are some export management companies in india i would be selling my production to the export management companies in india and these export management companies will find the client in the foreign country to sell my product so i am not in direct contact with the client in the foreign market so this become a indirect way of exporting another could be a contractual mode of exporting where i uh, i am and maybe i am a, it's like a piggy back exporting where i may be the rider company and you might be a carrier company generally a small company become a rider company large and big company become a carrier company say for example you are manufacturer of printers computer printers right and those printer require ink and i as a rider company manufacturing the ink of the printer your printer is of no use without the ink so what you will be doing you will be exporting my ink along with your printer so i become a rider company with your carrier company and that will come under the contractual mode of exporting next is international subcontracting now what is this here i may not be having a sufficient resources in my own country so what i will look for i will look for some other country like china vietnam thailand indonesia to do certain production this what this is the case which happen in uh, uh, in the company like nike nike what nike did they they started into the subcontracting for entering into international market like china vietnam thailand indonesia bangladesh in order to get their work done by them what i as a company would be doing as a nike what i would be doing i would be supplying certain design certain raw material to them for doing the basic production of the product and proper processing and manufacturing will take place in the host country they will not hold any right over the raw material which i am supplying they will be doing the production against the processing fees so that is what known as international subcontracting this is what apple company is also doing they are forwarding some of the spare parts raw material design system to china and china is doing the processing of the product or for the apple and they are charging processing fees from the apple company they don't own any right over the raw material that is what international subcontracting is next is the counter trade this is the old mechanism where country used to find the host country or the other country where i can sell the product against the product that was that used to be the scenario of the barter system i am having rice you are having wheat i need wheat you need rice let's exchange the commodity that is the example of the counter trade here we trade against the goods or against the services i am producing certain thing you are producing certain thing let's exchange them because i may not be able to produce wheat you might not be able to produce rice so let's exchange them that's an example of the counter trade this what happened in the system of barter next type is the management contract management contract talks about that you are selling your expertise to some institution or the body for establishing some of the maybe that let's take an example before giving you the theoretical understanding let's take the example of disney what disney did disney uh, took the uh, ownership of japanese um, and the japanese uh, they they took the uh, the management contract fees from the japanese country and from the japan and they started building the theme park for the japan and till the time that park is fully developed by the disney that will come under the management contract as soon as that park is developed disney is free from that and disney will get the royalty and the fees for developing such kind of the theme park for the japan that means you are sharing your expertise you are sharing your experience you are sharing your knowledge 
right for uh, equip for developing in the maybe the system or for maybe training the workers of that country or maybe the citizens of that country or maybe is some company's worker right you are sharing your skills and knowledge and that is going to be the part of the management contract disney comes out to be the best example for this for you to understand next is transfer related entry modes as far as transfer related entry modes are concerned it is going to be the transfer of the ownership in the trading there was no transfer of ownership was taking place but here there will be a transfer of ownership as in case of leasing i i become the lesser you become the lessee have to pay the fees of buying particular system or the building or the manufacturing unit of mine many of the companies are leasing the products take an example of a japanese company mitsubishi they put their 100 used trucks and some new trucks as well to china chinese company particularly who were into mining construction and transportation work and chinese company that chinese mining and construction transportation company was paying the fees on a annual basis to japanese mitsubishi company that is what leasing is next is international licensing licensing usually take place in case of intellectual products like copyright patent trademark right i may give you the license of using my script i may give you a license of using in my country folk song for your movies so licensing is related to intellectual property right so here you are going to get the royalty against the license which you have given to the licensor next is international fi- franchising international franchising you take just uh, is about you are not just selling the idea you are also selling or you are sharing your rather than selling what you are doing you are sharing your idea you are sharing your promotional strategies you are sharing your infrastructural strategies to some of the franchisee you become a franchiser like mcdonald's kfc they are the franchisers lee maridan is the hotel uh, sector is also into a franchising right so they are giving the right to the franchisee to make use of your marketing strategies to make use of your ideas your product your features your style of doing business your style of developing the infrastructure but you have to pay the fees to those you have to work as per the strategies set by the franchising company next is the turnkey operation build operate transfer build operate own and transfer these are two different kind of the turnkey operation you it predominantly seen in case of technology transfer again or in case of intellectual uh, property transfer right uh, so in build operate transfer is also one of the good example in case of the construction of building you give a right to you the builder right builder uh, got the pro- builder ask you to sign certain flats in a building and you had paid certain initial amount to the builder and eventually the builder will start building the flats for you and once the flats are ra- ready he is going to transfer the possession to you so that is a very good ideal example of build operate and transfer and during this process of operating he is also owning each and every flat he is taking care of each and every flat and make sure when you are getting the possession whether everything is in place or not so that is what owning right you are owning that is an advance thing that you own you have the responsibility till the time the final possession is going to take place by the concerned party so turnkey operation is most commonly seen in case of construction and building technology even when you are developing some software for a company company has given you a fair idea about human resource information system and you need to develop the hris for x company and uh, you started working on it and eventually you come across certain problems you question them back they give you the correct answer they give you the correct solution and you develop a complete software for hris now how these people are going to work on hris you have to train them 
that means you are owning the responsibility of letting the employee know that how this particular HRIS system is going to work in your organization. And if any case any error runtime error occur, it's your responsibility as a software company to ensure that runtime error to be overcome or reduced or you need to rework on them to come up with a better solution to your client. So that is built, operate, own and transfer. But on the contrary side, if it is just built, operate, transfer, you might be developing a software. You understood the idea why this particular software need to be developed. So you develop the software, you operate it in your office and you pass on the possession to the company that see this is what the software you asked for. We have developed it and you have transferred it. Now, when, it, when there are some runtime error, they are not going to own the responsibility of it. You as a company have to again call the company, you have to again pay the fees to them for overcoming those runtime errors. So build, operate, transfer is one of the mechanism which is little outdated. Now the advanced one is build, operate, own and transfer. Now let's move to the FDI related different entry modes when it comes to a business of a brownfield investment or when it comes to a business of greenfield investment or greenfield development you can either go for branch office right when it is a you when you are starting your business from scratch that is greenfield investment or greenfield development you are doing a business in any of the special economic zone area listed by the government then it is going to be a greenfield development when you are investing uh, your money in any of the metro city or the city which is not listed under the special economic zone or export processing zone then it is going to be just merely a greenfield investment so if you are opening your any branch in your opening your branch in any of the host country it is going to be the branch office and it is largely regulated by whom it is going to be regulated by the headquarters it is going to be regulated by the parent company and it is having a same legal identity the legal identity is not going to be changed legal identity is going to be the same or intact in case of the branch office where in case of wholly owned subsidies you are forming a new legal identity old legal identity identity is there but here you are going to form the new legal identity new legal identity is going to be formed in case of wholly owned subsidies whereas in case of branch office it is not the case and these are two are the example of greenfield investments or it could be the example of greenfield development as well but when it comes to merger joint venture acquisition strategic exam these are the examples of brown field investments right here you are not starting from scratch you are starting from some level like merger here in case of merger you are not losing your own identity here you are actually losing your identity first you have to dissolve your identity then only you can merge your company so like an example of Procter & Gamble, GlaxoSmithKline are the best example of the merger. In case of Procter & Gamble, two companies dissolve their individual identity. They form the new company that is a Procter & Gamble. Now individually would, wouldn't see the products of Procter, individually you don't see the product of Gamble. Now the products come under the label of Procter & Gamble. Similarly in case of GlaxoSmithKline, the Glaxo is a separate company. There were three companies merged together to form a single company that is GlaxoSmithKline. In case of joint venture, you don't have to lose your individual identity. That means you don't have to dissolve your individual identity. Keeping your ind individual identity intact, you can form the new business. Right. So the joint venture is going to take place. In case, for example, uh, like Starbucks, Tata is the best example of joint venture. TVS, Suzuki. TVS, BMW, right? These are some of the examples of the joint venture where company are having their own individual identity, but apart from their individual identity, they have some more project with a particular company and it is time based. As soon as the project gets get over, the joint venture can be dissolved. Like the case of Hero Honda. Hero Honda used to have a joint venture, but as soon as the time and the time gets over, the in joint venture was dissolved between the two. Next is the acquisition. 
acquisition that means it is not like that only a big company is going to acquire the small company this is not the case even a small company can acquire the big company take an example of tata chorus d such a big giant tata able to acquire it so what is tata able to acquire even land rover jaguar so what required the right strategies are required right international business strategies are required for having the acquisition action in the international market so even uh, the facebook acquired the whatsapp nokia was acquired by the microsoft in the year of 2014 later nokia sold microsoft sold off the nokia back to uh, hmd in the year 2016 so acquisition is about acquiring the entire company now the company don't have its own existence the company who acquire continue with their existence but the company being acquired lost the uh, existence lost its legal identity next is a strategic alliance strategic alliance is like a cooperative joint venture take an example of a, a starbuck barner and noble company noble um, barner is into the book selling it's a library of books right so let's come together let's have a system of have drinking a coffee while reading a book so that's a style of the strategic alliance now let's move to the different modes of entering into the international market first is country specific factor so far we have understood the different style of entering into international market the different fdi it's a trade related it's a transfer related it's fdi related so far we have a fair understanding what kind of the entry mode in international market so now we can broadly understand on the basis of the country which particular style of entry mode can be used say for example a Uh, in case of a country specific factor you have to see what kind of fdi policies are there prevailing in that host country say for example if you are looking for entering into north korea you won't be able to enter because they have ceiling and strict uh, fdi policies so you need to see in which particular country you want to enter for doing the business or trading you need to see what kind of fdi policies they are having if it is liberal you can easily enter if it is strict you won't be able to easily enter into the country industry specific factors industry specific factor like in case of india there are strict regulatory regulation against the defense factories or defense industry sectors so if anybody would like to enter into the defense sector of india they have to undergo certain strict licensing process it is not so liberal as in case of other business firm specific sector right that is you might be having certain an uh, inclination toward a particular firm because you are already into the same kind of the business so you really want to enter into the same related business or same related firm right you are into some technology so you would like to see further advancement of technology should take place when you are moving to the host country so you will look for some it sector company already doing good in, in india so you would like to associate with them so that your project can be done so that your you can outsource some of your work so that can be the firm specific factor right like in case of nike they try to find out certain firm specific factor they try to find out who can produce the products of the nike right who can who can manufacture as per their standard or who are having the required resources like vietnam is having the resources like china is having the resources so they establish their where the unit over these countries next is the project specific factor this is going to be a point of concern when the project is quite big or large mnc usually don't want to put their money solely into it they want some partnership because they want to reduce the risk so project specific factor is another very essential factor to be taken into consideration when you are choosing the mode of entry if the project is big then you need to find out who else can be your partner government is going to be your partner or some other private institutions are going to be your partner that is going to help you to minimize the risk of investing in the foreign market because fdi money is not that easy money it cannot be easily taken back you can easily enter comparatively but exit is going to be very difficult right so today uh, we had discussed so many things related to the strategies of international business let's quickly review the different topics that we discussed today that's first thing that we discussed is the difference between international business and domestic business we able to figure out that 
how tough it is for international business to enter into the foreign market what are the criteria they have to take into consideration when they are looking for the host country and uh, comparatively it is easier for domestic business to do business in their own country because they are brought and brought up in their own country they know the rules and regulation the entire system the customer taste and preference everything is known to them so comparatively it is easier for the domestic company to do the business in the domestic environment second in this lecture we learn about the strategies of going in international market we come to know about FDI, we come to know about FII, we have also understood the different types of FDI like greenfield investment, like greenfield development, like brownfield investment and we have also understood some trade related aspects of doing the business. We also understood the FDI, different set of the FDI which we can use for entering into the international market. I hope dear learners you have understood the today's lecture. All the best for future. Thank you. Hello, good morning everybody. I am uh, Raghunandan Sengupta. So, I will just give you uh, the a very brief uh, excitement area of finance which is quantitative finance and that has a huge market starting around about 10 years back and it is exploding exponentially. So, what uh, do we mean by quantitative finance? Quantitative finance is actually the application of different mathematical and statistical techniques in the area of financial markets, be it say for example, derivative pricing, be it in the area of say for example, portfolio management, be it in the area of asset liability management, be it in the area of portfolio management, we see that the application has exploded in such a way that there is a huge opportunity for people who have a quantitative background in mathematics and statistics, they can utilize those in the area of finance, but obviously with some prior knowledge of, of, of uh, finance as a subject. Now, when we say about quantitative finance, as I said, it is an area of applied mathematics and statistics applied in, in financial markets. Use of different areas, if somebody is interested to know, we have stochastic calculus, we have derivative pricing, we have operation research, we have quantitative techniques like differential uh, equations, stochastic calculus, time series and they are heavily used in the area of quantitative finance as I mentioned. Now, we all know that in, in, in 1997, the Nobel Prize in Economics, so it is basically the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was given to the work of Merton and Scholz in the area of derivative pricing and after that, there has been an exponential increase in the area of, of quantitative techniques in, in, in quantitative finance and the, in the area of, of different type of derivative pricing. With the advent, moreover with the advent of, of high-ended and sophisticated computing data, big data has come in a very big way where application areas starting from computing from different type of algorithm design have been taken up in such a big way that nowadays at least we are able to understand that how high frequency data algorithm trading can be utilized using the concept of quantitative finance in the area of, of finance as such. But there is a flip side also obviously when, when, when there is a huge amount of development, so obviously due to some regulation errors or something, there has been some, some pitfalls which I think is should be a bullet point for people who are in really interested to take up quantity finance, they should be aware. So, consider the financial crisis in 2008 and later on and we are seeing different banks are failing, different financial institutions are facing a problem, countries are facing a problem like in Europe, in, 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 in USA. So, what should be done? So, the main thing is that 
even if you know the technique is best for people who are investors, who are private players, organizations like banks, governments should use these techniques in a very somber manner such so that the application areas of quantitative finance using the techniques which we learned can be utilized in the best possible way to garner the overall the in-depth knowledge a person has in trying to utilize these quantitative techniques in finance. And I am sure that people who have the background, who have the knowledge, who have the, the sophistication, who have the, the knowledge of the society can definitely use quantitative finance in a very big way in trying to make their mark in this exciting field which you are going to see in years to come. And I am sure it will be a very exciting learning tool for all the participants who, who will take quantitative finance as a, as, a, as a subject in years to come. Thank you and I, am, and I wish all the participants all the best and best of luck for the programs they will take. Thank you.